Welcome to the putback on SNY.TV. I'm Ian Begley, SNY's NBA insider, and we've got a great show for you today on all SNY social platforms, including YouTube. We've got two guests very, very near and dear to this show. One, we have John Macri, the dean of Nick's Film School, and we also have a very special guest today, ESPN senior NBA reporter, host of the Hoop Collective, Brian Windhorse is with us today to break it all down. We'll be talking Knicks. We'll be talking playoff picture, injuries, NBA. We're getting into all of it. Let's start off with the baseline. Knicks losing three straight. Their third loss came last night in Miami. They're scuffling a little bit. I think the guys who are playing 40-plus minutes a night are or maybe a little bit gassed, so it'll be interesting to see how they can finish out this season. Right now, they sit in fifth because <clears throat> they don't have the tiebreaker with the Orlando Magic, and Miami and Indiana are kind of sitting right behind them. They are, I believe, a two games or a game and a half behind Cleveland for that third spot in the East, and a few games to go here. We'll see how it shakes out, but uh, Brian, I want to start with you because the Knicks are playing their regulars a significant amount of time, partially because of OG Ananobi and Julius Randle. Uh, I got some info and, and thoughts on on those two guys and their injuries, but where are you uh, with OG and Julius? And do you, what are you hearing? Do you think they'll be back before the end of the regular season? I think OG's got a better chance than Julius. Um, uh, you know, OG has a strange injury. Uh, we don't see elbow injuries very often in the NBA. It's not, you know, when a player sprains his ankle, um, he has a history, understands his injury, you know. Um, there's certain recovery from a knee injury that um, there's protocols to go through. This elbow injury, it's a very unusual injury. So it's very hard to have a good feel for it. He, you know, the thing about OG, and the Knicks knew this when they traded for him, he is a guy who likes to take his time coming back from injuries. He wants to be as close to 100% as possible. Um, that is not secret information. The Knicks were aware of that uh, when they signed him. They'll, they'll be aware, or when they traded for him, they'll be aware of that, I assume, when they sign him. And so that just is what it is. In the, in the case of Julius, I mean, he's clearly stagnated. They've given no update. Um, you know, he's gone past the, 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 the recovery, initial recovery timeline. Guys, I just, I've just i been around long enough to know about shoulder injuries. Most of the time on a shoulder injury, you have to have surgery. And when you can gut through it, you are susceptible to re-injury on that shoulder. So in all honesty, that was a really upsetting um, injury for the Knicks. Um, I know that it seemed like it was good news initially when they said he didn't need surgery, but the way they framed the reporting of the injury – it was actually kind of shaky because they, they made it clear he was going to be reevaluated. And so even if he's able to play, you're going to be worried about re-injury. That is just the nature of this injury. And like I said, most people with this injury eventually have to have surgery. And that's just, that's just the unfortunate truth. Yeah, I'll start on, on Julius, Brian. I think you, you hit it all. But one thing uh, that I've heard just brought up in conversations is Carmelo Anthony and his shoulder, <clears throat> excuse me, his shoulder injury the year that the All-Star game was in New York. Um, he was hurt. Surgery was recommended. He held out a little bit, uh, played in the All-Star game. I think he played a few more games and then eventually shut it down and had surgery. And I think his rehab was several months long. And I think this is a similar injury with Julius Randle. I don't think it's identical, but I think the, the labrum is a, is a significant part of this injury, I was told. So the issue is getting Randall to a place where the medical staff and he are comfortable that he can be on the court and make it through, right? They, they, I think everybody knows that he's going to need surgery eventually. Is it surgery in the off season? Is he, or is he going to be unable to make it back to the court. And the idea that he's been sitting at this place where he's doing everything, but being cleared for contact, and that's worried a bunch of people. We noted it a few weeks ago, and that's it's still been the case here where everybody's kind of waiting on pins and needles for him to get cleared for that full contact. If you know Julius Randle, he's going to want to play. Uh, I think the medical staff has been very careful here. Uh, with this one, with actually getting him back on the floor. I do think there were some people who felt, you know, way back 
that he should should have gone and had surgery uh, right when it happened, and then maybe he's back at this point, or he's back a couple weeks from now at the beginning of the postseason. Um, that didn't happen, and here we are with Randall just waiting. And with OG Ananobi, similar situation in terms of the waiting game, but he had the surgery, right? And the Knicks and OG felt really good about that decision. He came back. Uh, he looked very good in his, his first game back. He hurt himself the next game back on a pretty standard basketball play. So I think the thing there is how do you get him to a place where he does not re-aggravate that injury on a, on a pretty standard basketball play where his arm kind of got jammed up. And so there's shooting, there's defense, there's so many different things with the elbow. Uh, it's about trying to get the inflammation down. And, I, and I've been told even once you get that inflammation down with OG and Anobi, there's still going to be tests to clear, hurdles to clear from a medical team standpoint before he gets clearance to get on the floor. So I, I think we're still days away at least from an OG and an OB return and Randall. Um, it's just anyone's guess at this point. Tom Thibodeau told reporters last night in Miami that he's just going to keep working at it. Julius, that is, and it'll turn. Maybe it'll turn. Hopefully it'll turn. Maybe it'll turn tomorrow. Maybe it'll turn in a few days, but they just don't know. It's just up in the air, and, and it's about clearance from the medical staff on both guys. So big, big issues hanging over the heads of this team. Jonathan, Macri, if they do not have Ananobi and they do not have Randall. What do you think their ceiling is in this postseason? I mean, I want to choose my words carefully because this team, uh, both this season and last season, has overcome adversity as much as uh, and as regularly as any team in the NBA. So I, I don't want to belittle their chances with a group that is going out there and is is fighting. And even as they're losing games here, they're fighting and they're they're keeping this thing close. Um, that said, you know, I, I think more than the fact that they don't have OG and Julius in the starting five, their lack of depth is really being exposed here. I mean, you can't ask much more of Dante DiVincenzo. He's, you know, third in the league in threes on the season. Can't ask more of Deuce McBride. He's putting up 20 a game over his last eight. Um, Isaiah Hardenstein, he's, you know, second in the league in defensive EPM. But at a certain point in time, you are running out of guys who you feel comfortable putting on the floor in a playoff series. If you're telling me they're facing an Orlando team that is one of the younger teams in the league and has a bottom 10 offense, uh, you know, there's only been one other team in the last eight years that has advanced out of the first round with the bottom 10 offense, and that's last year's Heat. And with all due respect to this Magic team, they do not have the track record. They do not have the veteran presence. That, you know, certainly don't have Jimmy Butler, Spo, the whole thing that that Heat team did. So I, I would feel at least like they would have a pretty decent chance against the Magic um, if that was the first round uh, matchup. But other than them, I, I would have trouble seeing the Knicks, uh, this version of them. Again, no OG, no Randall being picked to come out of a first round series um, against anybody else. I want to go here on Julius Randall too, because I think it's more than just getting cleared and getting back on the court and, and feeling good. You know, I think, Part of the thing here is, and every Nick fan knows this, if he comes back, he'll be less than 100%. He won't be able to use his shoulder and use his force the way he's accustomed to. And does he, does he just become a jump shooter at that point? And we all know if he misses jump shots and they lose a game, a series, fair or not, he's going to be a lightning rod for criticism. So, I mean, I, I have to think – just assuming, knowing Julius Randle is a human being, that that might factor in here. Maybe not. Maybe he doesn't care. Uh, but there's also, you know, future extension on the table. The idea of doing significant damage to this shoulder uh, if you're coming back and playing with it without the operation. Uh, Brian, as far as those other factors, what do, you, what do you see there? How do you assess that? Do you think that plays into what we're going to see here? I don't. I mean, I think Julius has proven that he'll – He's a durable player. This is an unfortunate injury. Um, as far as an extension goes, um, he's proven his value to the Knicks. You know, the only reason that they wouldn't extend him is to keep set cap flexibility. I don't think they wouldn't extend him because of this injury. Um, I think he's going to probably have to have the surgery anyway, no matter what happens. <clears throat> so I'm not sure that's entering into the thinking. But I actually do think the Knicks – would have a decent shot in a first round series because if they played the Cavs, uh, Donovan Mitchell is really severely hampered right now with a knee injury. He's been a shell of himself uh, since the All Star break. Um, 
And if that ended up being the four or five matchup either way, and Donovan is not himself, uh, the Knicks have supreme confidence against the Cavs. The Cavs um, struggle with the Knicks' physicality. And I know Mitchell Robinson hasn't looked great since he's come back, but give him a couple more weeks, he just terrorizes the Cavs. I actually would like the Knicks in that series. Um, and then if they play Orlando, as you said, there's certain things that, you know, they have some advantages there. And, you know, I think in that series, they have the best player. And certainly in a series where Donovan Mitchell is, is, is compromised, they have the best player in that series too. So, um, I, I, I mean, I, do I, do I like the Knicks, um, chances with OG and Randall Moore, or especially OG, the way they've played? Yeah. Uh, but I, I would not count them out at all. Um, depending on that first round matchup uh or we, we we had a new wrinkle thrown into the eastern conference last night when with jo- with um joel and b coming back i thought he looked really good um coming off eight weeks off obviously he was rusty and out of rhythm but i thought he had a lot going for him and right now they're in the eighth seat i don't know we you know they're, they're going to make it out of the play-in but um you know the the knicks could avoid philly by where they are, where they fall, they could avoid having to deal with Philly in the first round. So um, I actually, you know, obviously you want the two players that you're banking on back, but I actually don't think the Knicks outlook for doing something in the postseason is as dire as you guys see it. It's fair, very fair. And I want to get to that best player in the series that you referenced, Brian, and Jalen Brunson. But I want to hear from both of you guys on one last piece here with OG Julius. Do you think, Brian, that, this injury, if he doesn't come all the way back, do you think it impacts at all the way the Knicks would approach free agency with Ananobi? Mm-hmm. My answer is no. I think there there's a commitment uh, at this point for bringing him back, regardless of how things play out with the injury. What are your thoughts? Yeah, the, when they made the trade, they committed themselves. I mean, maybe not actually committed, but they they actually you know they made it clear that they were gonna they were gonna resign him. The, the number will be interesting. Um, there, you know, we could talk a long time about the number because the Knicks are in a position where they need to stay flexible, um, but uh, they're going to resign him. I would almost guarantee it. And um, the when when he resigns, uh, if slash when he resigns, he will still be a guy who is going to sometimes be a challenge for Nick fans because, especially for Tibbs, because he doesn't have the same you know, level of playing with injuries that some of the other players on the Knicks do. You know, there's these guys on this team who won't literally want to play 48 minutes and the coach wants them to play 48 minutes. There's guys who want to play 82 games. OG Ananobi, I think, maybe this is the fourth time in his career, fourth or fifth time, maybe fourth time in his career where he's failed to play 50 games. You know, there was a couple of COVID-impacted seasons in there, but, you know, that's who he is. So you're going to love him when he's out there, but he's going to frustrate you. That's been who he's been his whole career, and it's who he's been in New York. John, your reaction to that on OG? I, I think Brian nailed it with his contract was signed the day that they made that trade. Uh, you don't give up what you gave up, both in terms of Emmanuel Quickly being you know, their, their best young prospect, and then R.J. Barrett, who you know had his detractors, but R.J. gave a salad production, and I think just as importantly, he was that kind of big salary slot that you were going to use in, in that sort of a trade. So now that they've sent that out, they don't really you know, have uh, as much fun, fungible salary to send out. I mean, yeah, they have the bogey, you know, potentially expiring contract, assuming they pick up that team option um, or rather fully guarantee it. Um, but like he, OG proved the concept uh, of what this team could look like after they got him. The record speaks for itself. The lineup data speaks for itself. The fit, I think, with Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle speaks for itself um you know that was the thing for years and years rj had some nice moments julius had some nice a lot of nice moments uh they did not make each other better and with og and anobi it's like all the pieces fully fit into place and for as much as i think as brian said it will be frustrating if he's you know playing games you know in the 50s and 60s as far as your game play total moving forward the knicks where at least I think they hope to be going in not only this year, but more importantly, the next few years 
is they're going to care about whether he's good to go in April, May, and, and, you know, God willing one day before I die, June. Um, so, you know, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if we could get to that point. Long way to go. Um, but that's really where, where my concern lies. And I'm, I'm fine giving him the bag uh, when the time comes this summer. Jeez, let's not get too morbid, John. You're a, you're a healthy <laughs> young man in early 40s. I think you're going to be around for a while, uh, God willing. Okay. But let's get to uh, let's get to Mr. Jalen Brunson. Uh, been a big topic lately in terms of the fouls he's getting, the fouls he's not getting. Tibbs made it clear last night that he feels that Brunson is not getting calls. He's kind of danced around the sh- subject over the past few weeks, but last night he said directly that Jalen Brunson's getting fouled. I would assume that he's going to take a little fine for that, but maybe he feels like it's worth it to get that message out there. He said it five times, I believe. I think it was seven. Was it seven? Yeah, I think it was seven, which I think he could have said it five times and it would have been okay. The last two maybe was a little much, but hey, uh, I'm not writing the scripts here. So let's go to that topic, though. Brian Windhorst. I know you talked about this on the Hoop Collective. What are your thoughts on Jalen Brunson and how he gets officiated? Yeah, I was at the game in San Antonio last Friday, and um, that was another frustrating night for the Knicks where I think the free throws were 32 to 12. Um, And uh, Jalen is getting a poor whistle. He is also... um, a victim of the way the NBA is officiating the games the second half of the year, where they're very more cognizant of the players who are contract or contact initiators and sort of foul hunters. And I know that people didn't like that I said Jalen was a foul hunter, but unfortunately he is a foul hunter. Not every time. That doesn't mean every time he's doing that. Sometimes he goes in there and he gets hit and he goes down and there's no call. But he has these tricks. You know, one of the tricks that he uses is he gets in front of a player and he stops, waits for the guy to run into him. That's the Trey Young. The league is like specifically outlawed that. Um, and when that happens, and I, you know, in the San Antonio game, I think he tried it three times. He actually got the call once. The other two times he didn't get the call. Like they like pretty much outlawed that. Um, so like if you're going to get upset when you see that, and he's going to get upset when it happens, they're not going to give him that call. They're just not. Um, and so there's a, you know, both things can be true. He can be a victim of the league cutting down on foul hunting and he can be getting a poor whistle. Um, and it's, well, I think what the frustrating thing is, is that it, it feels like it's happened a number of games in a row and the Knicks are in a losing streak. Um, I think that's the combination of that. And, uh, I get it. Um, and you know, Tibbs is trying to defend his guy and, you know, he also was the subject of a couple of very high profile end of game calls earlier this season. Mm. It seems like that's his, um, that's his MO. I would say that Jalen is such a brilliant player that his game, it shouldn't be predicated on whether he gets fouls or not. Um, he, he, his package that he has, um, he's like the best stopper in the league his ability to to slow to stop himself it's absolutely as elite as you'll ever see the way he's able to get a full head of steam and then stop and change directions he's he's such an expert at creating space i would just say to him jalen create your space don't worry about trying to get the contact um because he's so brilliant at it and uh but i i understand the frustration especially during a losing streak John, your frustration level with Brian Windhorst and his inflammatory <laughs> comments on Jalen Brunson. No, look, I, I I understood where Brian was coming from, and I think it's fair to say that, um, look, if you're a small guard in the league today, if you are not to some extent going out of your way to seek content, contact and draw fouls, then you're not doing everything you could be doing to win. I think what got under the skin of some Knicks fans is that, you know, when you watch – Trey Young and you watch James Harden do what they do. That's to me at least, reasonable minds may differ. Like that, that's not basketball. Uh, some of the stuff that they would resort to, and I think that's why the league, or at least part of the reason why the league, ultimately felt the need to uh, change some of these rules. And Jalen Brunson, I don't think it, you know, falls into the same category as them. At least not to that extent. Does he do? You know, does he take a few pages 
from their respective playbooks, as Brian just said, the, the, the stopping short, you know, the old the old Frank Costanza. Absolutely. He does. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he does it as, as well as anyone. Um, but there's also a lot of other parts to the way he draws fouls. And there's just a physicality to his game and how much he is willing to put his body on the line as a guy. I know he's listed at 6'2". I, I, I don't think I've ever bought that. But like, and I think that's what, what has, I know me, you know, kind of perturbed more than anything because you're seeing things that even as the league has shied away from some of the stuff they want to litigate out, I think are, are still legitimate fouls. And I think we're in this kind of in-between place where, you know, what is a foul now? What isn't a foul? So I don't blame Brian at all. I, I would just like to get to a place where we have a bit more clarity on, again, what, well, what are legitimate calls. There's nuance, right? Yeah. Do I, is he falling down on three-pointers like Harden does? No, of course not. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things Harden was, is brilliant at is – Going into the going into a drive and placing his hands in a in a way that will guarantee yeah. a foul going up, um, you know. But what I'd say is is that they're not giving him the call. They're not. So, and I think I think just in general, when a team teams tend to lean on the officiating when their margins are tighter. So right now the Knicks are missing a few guys. Um, you know, Jalen's having games where he scores 60 points and they don't win. And um, it's, 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 you know, you, you get more frustrated when you're, when you're losing and you need that call more than if you're not. Um, Jalen Brunson doesn't need um, to hunt fouls to be a brilliant, brilliant player. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to get MVP votes on the ballot. He's having a brilliant year. He's going to get a huge contract extension soon. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't need to worry about that. And um, I get, I get the Tibbs. I, Tibbs has got to defend his guy and that's his prerogative, but um, I don't think it's healthy for Nick fans either to, to go into a game and think that they're not winning a game because, you know, they're not getting a friendly whistle. That's, that's not a way to. That's not a way to to to, to execute. And that's not the way. Frankly, that's not the way Tibbs executes. You know, Tibbs. You know, obviously he's got to defend his guy. But Tibbs is a, Tibbs is a believer. If you only they scored ninety nine last night, if you could only get ninety nine points, you then the way you win is by giving up ninety eight. Yeah. You know, you don't you don't. The Tibbs way is not to go and you know try to get a couple extra fouls at the end of the game. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't complain about it, but. I understand what I understand the frustration, especially when you look at the foul totals um, and, the, the, and the, the, the feeling that it's happened several games in a row. Brian has to jump out of here in a couple minutes, so we just want to get to this quickly a little segment we call stargazing here on the putback, where we take a look at the future with the Knicks. We know that uh, some people claim the media makes too much of stars connected to the Knicks, but. James Dolan, Nick Governor, is on record as saying one of the reasons he brought Leon Rose here was to attract top players. So there is validity to this. And I want to get into one thing because uh, there's been some reporting on Paul George lately and the Sixers. And we had noted on the putback a few weeks back that people with Philly certainly saw George as a target uh, earlier this season. I, I don't know where they're at with it right now. But Brian, Paul George isn't he a lock to go back to the Clippers? I mean, that's that's the way kind of I, I see it right now. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm not sure that the league believes that Paul George is actually going to leave the Clippers. I think what they believe is they're not giving him the offer that he wants. And that stage was set when they extended Kawhi Leonard earlier this season for not only less than max dollars. In fact, he's taking a mild pay cut. Now, He's still going to be making $50 million a year in that three-year extension, so let's not cry. But he took less than max years and less than max dollars and a mild pay cut. And that set the stage for the Paul George negotiations. And I'm sure Paul, <coughs> excuse me, he was younger Bless. than, than um, he was younger, obviously, than Kawhi, doesn't want that. But he's sort of boxed in a little bit. And so it's in Paul George's... Um, benefit to present that he has other options and teams who are willing to offer him a max contract. Um, you know, for the first 
you know, for the, for the last five years, the Clippers have pretty much allowed themselves to be steamrolled by Paul George and Kawhi Leonard um, in many different ways, including their contracts and acquiring them and things like this. They've kind of drawn a line in the sand, not because they're trying to be jerks, but because the new rules, which are really designed to break the Clippers up, uh, really forces them into changing their posture. And so they did with Kawhi and they set a precedent. And so the question becomes is, do you honestly believe that, you, that Paul George would leave the Clippers or are you just going to be a stalking horse for him to give the best till he possibly can? And his agent's job will be to make the Clippers believe that he would leave. And, and especially if they're not able to get, he's eligible to sign an extension. He also can opt into his contract. I don't think he'll do that. I think he'll just become a free agent if they don't have a deal. But um, it is unusual in today's day and age that a star player becomes truly an unrestricted free agent. And I'm sure that, you know, that's a, a, situ, um, a, a thing that um, they, the Clippers will want to use. Uh, but I would be very careful building around. The other thing is the Knicks don't have cap space. Yeah. So the right. way you would get Paul George would be to trade him, trade for him, a sign and trade. Well, the Clippers don't have to participate in that. Hmm. The Clippers can say, no, we're offering you this contract. We're not right. going to sign and trade you. And this is all a game of chicken the guys from Los Angeles and I believe his family likes living here. I'm in Los Angeles right now. So they like living here. So, um, you know, I'm sure Philadelphia would offer the max. The question is whether he would accept. So it's definitely one to something to keep an eye on. Very intriguing. Brian, we really appreciate your time, man. Thank you so much. Obviously keep an eye on all ESPN screens, digital TV podcasts to listen to Brian's Intel and the NBA. Brian, thank you, man. Appreciate you guys. Take care. We are going to continue on, John and I, to digest some of the things that Brian has said. I had a million more questions for Brian. John, I'm yeah. sure you did too. Um, but taking Paul George out of the equation for a minute here, how do you think in terms of, let's just say, Julius Randle back, OG and an OB back, Knicks competitive in a second-round series, make, take it to six, seven games. It's clear they're right there, but they don't get over the hump. How would you like to see the Knicks pursue things this offseason in that scenario uh, from your perspective? Do you want to see them aggressive on players like a Paul George or you look at a Minnesota with the Carl yeah. Towns, everybody keeping an eye, obviously, in Philadelphia and, and other places? Would you like to see them be aggressive there in Cleveland? Um, or would you say, hey, let's run this back. Let's see what we can do over uh, a full season with OG and an OB. Let's see how far these guys can take it. I think you you just broke it down pretty good, and you, you more or less said the the three names, which you know obviously I follow everything you report and everything that gets said about this team from Brian and all the other national media. Um, those are the those are the three guys. I mean, their dream scenario, of course, would be Embiid uh, saying that's it, I'm ready to go and and do my thing in New York, which. If that situation presents itself, I don't think there's much of a conversation. The other two are more interesting, and I think they're interesting for different reasons. With the Towns thing in Minnesota, I think, and you know, you look at the Minnesota Timberwolves. I believe they are now nine and and four without Carl Anthony Towns since he's gone down. Um, you know, their offense has struggled, but then again, their offense kind of, kind of struggled all year. Um, their defense is still top five, um, so. You know, and with their ownership situation being, you know, extremely messy and the potential for them to want to cut costs this summer, what would be the price tag to get him? I, I am have always assumed that that Julius Randle would be a, a part of any potential deal. Maybe that's an incorrect assumption on my part. I, I don't know. You would know better than me. But either way, I think that's interesting because if the if you can theoretically get Carl Anthony Towns on the cheap what I don't know what that looks like. You, you know, you probably have to at least take a, a a meeting on it. And then with Mitchell, I think that's an interesting conversation because, you know, you look at how it's worked with Garland and Cleveland, two smaller ball dominant guards, and it I, I think the whole hasn't quite been greater than the sum of the parts. Meanwhile, here you have Dante DiVincenzo here in New York. What more you could possibly ask of this guy, I don't know. I mean, again, the two guys who have more three pointers than him this year are Steph Curry and Luka Doncic. So, you know, and he, he's he's averaged 20 points a game since OG and Julius went down. He really is an ideal fit 
I think next to Brunson, I think he's a, an ideal fit. If you have OG Ananobi as that number one lockdown defender, to have Dante DiVincenzo be as your, your number two guy, getting the passing lanes. He had four steals last night in Miami against the Heat. So, you know, and, and I think, you know, and again, you correct me if I'm wrong, you, you know a lot better than me, but I, I would not think that there was any scenario where they're getting uh, uh, Donovan Mitchell on any kind of cheap, relative cheap, uh, any anything. That would that would cost the whole the whole the whole kit and caboodle there. So tough conversations, but do, you know, do you have them? These are these are all star, all NBA level players. I think you have to have the conversation and then and then see what it, it looks like from there. Yeah, you certainly have to have that conversation. Uh, just two quick thoughts, um, Towns. I'll I'll continue to say it in, until he retires or, or Leon Rose and the group are not running the Knicks anymore. There's always going to be a degree of interest there in, in the Knicks and Towns. And it's just a matter of do things align in a way that makes sense for everybody, Minnesota, Towns, the Knicks. And Donovan Mitchell, um, you know, if I, we know that the Knicks were interested, very strongly interested uh, a couple summers ago, and uh, they didn't get there. Now, if the opportunity presents itself again, look, my guess is I'm assuming they – take a look, but I, I don't know guessing if their interest would be as strong as it was a couple off seasons ago, if that situation presents itself, but that's it's a conversation for another day. Uh, for us on the putback, you should know that we are available on podcast form these days. So be sure to check us out on podcast form, download us wherever you download those podcasts, including the wonderful uh, Nick's film school, digital work. So, that being said, John, we want to hit one more topic here sure. uh, before you go, and that's Miles McBride. His play has been mm. stellar of late. And I think a lot of people go uh, the Emmanuel Quickly route and comparing him to Quickly. I I'm not there yet, but just taking Miles as he is and looking ahead to the postseason, if everybody, again, gets healthy, where do you see him in this Nick rotation? Well, he's definitely going to be a part of it which is not something that I think I would have said um, a month ago. And I think he, he has to be a part of it for a few reasons. I mean, the defense, look, the defense speaks for itself. And the fact that it, it's it's not only that, you know, yeah, nominally, okay, if you have a, a guard on the other team who is capable of, like, creating havoc, that you, all right, you, we, we stick Miles with pride on him and, and you don't have to worry about who's going to defend that player. He is, I think his defense brings it to a new level where as an opposing player, I mean, you look at the game that Steph Curry had against him a few weeks ago. Steph Curry got his points because it's Steph Curry. Great players are always going to get their points. But you cannot relax for one minute that you were on the game and Miles McBride, uh, Deuce, is, is on the floor. And I think that sort of mentality is part of what makes this Nick team what they are. And that was, but but that we already knew that was there. And now when you factor in again, I, I saw the stat after the last night's game, and I was like, this has to be a misprint. He's averaging twenty points a game over his last eight. This was a guy who had played two hundred some odd career, or maybe it was one hundred and fifty something career games going into these last before these last eight, and had scored above twenty points a game twice in one hundred and fifty plus games. And now he's averaging twenty. And he's doing it on 50, 40, 90 shooting, obviously playing 45 minutes a night. It's it's wild how big a part he has become of their offense and how much they need his shooting. I think there are some interesting questions when it comes down to like, okay, again, you, you posited if OG's back and if Randall's back and if they're healthy and looking good. You know, what does it look like? I, I don't know. Maybe it looks like seven, eight minutes a half. Um, but I... I I'd be hard pressed to say that Deuce McBride should not be getting at least that uh, when when the when the time comes and and hopefully you know we're we're in a, a playoff series here. Yeah, tough sledding for the Knicks between now and then. By my count, they have only play two teams in their final, I believe, seven um, uh, that without anything to play for. I'm counting the Boston Celtics yep. in there because they have uh, they're far and away uh, first seed in the East. Brooklyn Nets uh, out of it. No shot at the plan, very little shot at the playing tournament. Every other team on their schedule from here on out is in the thick of a playoff seeding race. So a lot to be determined here over the next few days. John, if you had to guess where the Knicks end up in the standings, who are they playing in the first round? I'll go with the five seed. 
Um, I will be keeping a very close eye on the Magic, um, who are heading to New Orleans to face the Pelicans tonight. I think if the Magic lose that game, it more significantly opens up the door for the Knicks to finish ahead of Orlando. Orlando has some some easy games coming up after that. They also finish um, with a tough slate, but again, as you kind of just alluded to, you don't know what these teams are going to be playing for in the last week of the season. So you look at Orlando's schedule; they play the Bucks twice in the last week. So what you know, how much are the Bucks going to be caring about those games? We we don't know. You know, they're uh, they're also going to be playing the Sixers. You would think the Sixers are going to be going all out to win that one. Um, but as of right now, because Orlando owns that tiebreaker and because, as you just said, the Knicks are facing teams um, that have stuff to play for, I, I would I would bet on the five seed right now. Um, hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully it's a little bit better than that, but that's that's where I think they'll be. Five seed from John Macri. You heard it here first on the putback, and we'll see how things shake out over the next few days. It's going to be very interesting. Knicks Eastern Conference standings, that'll do it for us. On the putback, we will excuse me. We will be back with you next week for another episode, and then we will have one right after the end of the regular season. So stick with us. We appreciate you guys, and we'll see you soon.